Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley speaking to you from Washington, D.C. It's the afternoon of Friday, the 21st of August, 2015. We're looking at General Allen. We're looking at ISIS czar Allen, watching him closely. Join us, please, in keeping all eyes on Allen. We are now getting to make it or break it time for Allen. That is the biggest headline I think we can generate out of Washington, D.C. right now. Allen has now got approximately two weekends in order to take advantage of optimum conditions for a schemer and an intriguer, uh, such as Alan, of course, is. That is to say, he's actually got more. He's got a he's got a couple of weekends left. He's actually got three. He's down to three weekends. We would be talking here about the weekend of August twenty second to twenty third, twenty ninth to thirtieth, and then. September 5th to 6th, three weekends when Allen must strike. He wants to strike when Obama is out of town. That might even rule out the last of these weekends, the 5th and the 6th. Obama might already be back in town. So let's make it two to three weekends. Allen's modus operandi, wait until the president is out of town, conspire with his subversive, seditious network, and then call up Erdogan, call up the Saudis in Riyadh, call up other schemers. We, we need to develop the entire list, to be sure. And then strike, do something like the lunatic and obviously repudiated no-fly zone and safe haven for terrorists in northern Syria. If if Obama, if uh, Allen fails to act on the, over the next two to three late summer lazy hazy weekends, then Allen's goose could be cooked, because in the month of September, all eyes will turn to the Iran nuclear accord. Allen and Petraeus and their clique are determined to prevent this, but of course, Petraeus is pretending to do this, uh, not coming out as an open enemy, but I think trying to bore from within. The neocon faction, in other words, the neocon faction among disgruntled, venal, and retired generals, now represented by Petraeus. On these three weekends, Allen must act, because otherwise, in September, we will have the vote on the Iran nuclear accord it will be voted down by the reactionary warmonger Republicans. Obama will veto that. And then the warmonger and reactionary forces will attempt to override the veto. That will include Chucky e. Schumer, perhaps cheered on by his pornographic niece. And it will also you know, include Menendez, a guy who really, really should have been in jail already, indicted, guilty of what? Bribery, taking gifts. So uh, it looks like the Iran nuclear accord might well go through. There were some remarks by Mitch McConnell, right? Mitch McConnell, the Republican Senate leader, who seemed to say that Obama has a good chance of getting it through. Now, watch out for him. He's a snake. He's a fox. And this could be some kind of complicated side war strategy. Anyway, keep working on getting the Iran nuclear accord passed. But when you intervene, make sure you say, fire Allen, because the way in which the Iran nuclear accord might most readily be defeated is if the war situation explodes. In other words, uh, Erdogan needs a war. Right now, the polls are showing uh, for a November election in Turkey, which we'll talk about in a minute. If there's a November election in Turkey, then it's likely that that Erdogan will lose. So what Erdogan is doing right now, calling early elections, is a desperation ploy. 
He needs false flag. How about Allen? We just went through it. If we get to September and nothing has happened, Allen is also in big trouble. So there's another uh, person who would benefit from some kind of altercation, conflagration, or catastrophic uh, event. If Allen doesn't act now, he might soon find himself at the end of September out on his ear. In other words, as soon as that Iran nuclear accord goes through, I would think that Allen's blackmail and extortion strategy will fall to the ground and he will become eminently expendable in the bureaucratic wars. Now, let's look at the situation before which this all plays out. This morning, the Israelis have attacked Syria. And the interesting thing about this is the uh, Israeli missiles were fired at the Golan Heights, the Syrian-controlled part. It's all part of Syria, remember. It has been held since 1967 by the Israelis. The Israelis claim they killed some Palestinian militants who were shooting rockets at them. But it was 10.30 a.m. local time, five civilians uh, killed, according to the Syrian side, uh, and then a heavy uh, bombardment with these heavy howitzers that the Israelis like to play around with on that front. Now, it's the amazing thing about this is this is in favor of ISIS. You can see exactly how this works. The picture that has emerged during the week is the following. Last Saturday, the German defense minister, Ursula von der Leyen, had announced that Germany was pulling its Patriot missile batteries out of southern Turkey, taking them away from Erdogan. And the word was from von der Leyen, Christian Democrat, right, tool of Merkel, but nevertheless, von der Leyen says, hey, we helped you against Syria, Assad, but now there's really no threat from Assad, and you seem to be attacking the Kurds. The implication being, we don't want to be part of that, right? You're helping ISIS by getting rid of the most capable force that is opposing ISIS. Then on Sunday of last week, the United States also announced the pullout of Patriot missile batteries from southern Turkey. There are also reports that Spain had a Patriot missile battery there and has pulled that out. So within a very short time, varying in each one of these cases, right? it's not immediate, but it takes some weeks or perhaps even months, these Patriot missile batteries will be removed. And it may be that they're already demobilized, that they're already being packed up for the trip uh, back to the respective countries. Now, those Patriots can reach out a couple of hundred miles over Syrian territory, and they have provided a kind of air umbrella for the ISIS terrorists, especially along that 68-mile corridor where the Kurds do not control the um, the airspace, right? They, they, the, uh, I'm sorry, the the border on the ground. So uh, it means that from now on, the Syrian Arab Air Force will be able to attack concentrations of ISIS terrorists near the Turkish border, because those Patriot missile batteries, the main deterrent, will be gone. Now, at the same time, and this was yesterday, Thursday the 20th, we get the word from Moscow that Putin has delivered six MiG-31 jet fighters to Damascus. Now, this was a stealth operation. This was done secretly. It was not announced. It was a surprise. Uh, the um, I think the uh, State Department, Admiral Kirby, Admiral Kirby, of course, has moved from the Pentagon to Foggy Bottom, started whining about it. But this gives us a whole new situation, as we will explore in just a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio, sharply here in Washington, D.C. So the concept is that uh, two countries and possibly three, U.S., Germany, Spain, question mark on the Spanish one, but looks that they're part of it too, are pulling their Patriot missile batteries out of southern Turkey. Now, those are highly capable surface-to-air missiles. They can engage uh, airplanes. They can engage ballistic missiles, medium-range, short-range, things like this. They have a certain capability. It has been impossible 
for the Syrian Air Force to clobber the ISIS terrorist butchers that have been sheltering right up against the Turkish border, actually sometimes uh, also uh, protected by Turkish artillery under Erdogan, it has been uh, impossible to uh, attack those ISIS concentrations from the air. Now, once the patriots are gone, it becomes possible. The problem only was then, and the second problem, was that the Syrian Air Force did not have capable planes, up-to-date, modern, high-performance jet aircraft that could fly low along that border. The question now is, the jihadis have uh, been busy, right? They captured some of this stuff from Iraq when the Saudis bribed the Iraqi generals uh, a year ago. The jihadis have some kind of anti anti-aircraft defense. And the way you can foil that is by flying really low and really fast. So lo and behold, we now have six MiG-31 jet interceptors of uh, Soviet and Russian manufacture. These are highly capable. They are, uh, for example, the fastest, fastest air superiority jet fighter in the world, the fastest. Maybe they're not... Uh, ahead on everything, but certainly on that they are. And this is, on the whole, one of the most formidable jet aircraft that can be found anywhere in the world. Now, that combination spells doom for ISIS. If this is carried out, ISIS can be thoroughly clobbered. There's no air defense protecting them from Turkish soil, and they've got these, the Syrian Air Force has got these airplanes that can actually hit them. And isn't it funny that at just this point, the Israelis decide to attack Assad? It's a diversion, right? It's a diversionary attack, Entlastungsangriff, uh, in order to uh, relieve pressure that otherwise would build up rather quickly on ISIS. And, of course, the idiocy of most of the uh, the national public radio debates about this stuff, talking about U.S. troops, boots on the ground, all idiocy. Close the Turkish-Syrian border. Or better yet, let the Kurds close the Turkish-Syrian border. ISIS will die. They will wither on the vine. Their logistical supply lines, their uh, rear echelon will be completely cut off, and that will be the end of them. And of course, ISIS has been, uh, perhaps as if sensing their quite possible imminent demise, they've been on a orgy, a kind of a uh, atrocity spree. They've been uh, attacked. They destroyed a Christian monastery at Mar Elian. They've been uh, stepping up their beheadings. They beheaded a an archaeologist, a distinguished archaeologists at the Palmyra site. Their rape economy has been exposed. They're sending AIDS-positive, HIV-positive kamikazes into the Western world. So it's an orgy of horrors. And if you want to thank somebody for it, it's Alan. So the point is, focus on Alan, focus on the White House on the 22nd and 23rd, Watch this guy like a hawk. If you're inside the government bureaucracy, do what you can to make sure that this guy can't make a move. Now, our slogan, hashtag, fire Allen for ISIS. Fire Allen for ISIS. Erdogan, a desperation ploy. His puppet and ideologue, right, the neo-Ottoman ideologue Davutoglu, the former foreign minister, has been unable to form a government, right? The nationalists will not support the Islamists under Erdogan and Davutoglu. Remember, Turkish nationalism is serious. This is Ataturk. This is one of the top figures of the 20th century, a nation builder of the first order. So those uh, people have some kind of a serious heritage, whatever they are today. So they, they have refused to join a coalition dominated by the Islamists. Now, the nationalist party in Turkey would like to try to form a government. But of course, Erdogan and Davutoglu want to keep all power in their hands. So they've broken with tradition, quite possibly broken with legality, hard to judge from afar. 
Uh, they've called an election for November, and they say they are going to keep power in the meantime. In other words, there will be no uh, allowing the opposition to form a government. And it's quite possible that even in the caretaker government that Davutoglu will probably represent, they may try to exclude the opposition from that too. So it's going to be total AK, Erdogan, Muslim Brotherhood domination over this coming election. Now, the polls show that the HDP party, the Kurdish party, which did so well with 13 percent in the election back in June, they could gain even more. Uh, one of the things that we'll have to point out later in the broadcast, the Turkish pound is now at a three-year low. And uh, in a country where lots of stuff is imported, that's bad, because that means your your prices on all imported goods, right, all your Louis Vuitton and all this, uh, that is now uh, going up. So that's a very bad recipe for uh, Erdogan. Uh, the British have opened up diplomatic relations with Iran for the first time since, uh, what, 1978? Uh, and uh, we've got the um, Russian-Chinese naval drills going on, I believe, in the, uh, in the Far East. Um, so this is the situation. Uh, with the Israelis undertaking this bombardment and bombing of Syria in the Golan area, you can see how every... Uh, we say every imperialist is attempting to do everything possible to prop up ISIS, to prevent this situation now from playing, playing itself out to its proper uh, logic. The Turkish press, the Hurriyet, I think this means the Republic, but the Hurriyet uh, is freaking out completely. Uh, they're whining, complaining, and God knows what. So it's this situation. If you look at tarply.net, which I hope you do regularly, several times a week, we now have new stuff up there every day, every day. Our headline is Convergence of Putin and Obama against Allen and Erdogan. Moscow delivers six MiG-31 Foxhound aircraft to the Assad government. This can spell the doom of ISIS. Fire Allen for ISIS. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio, our program for Friday, the 21st of August. Now, we're honored once again to be joined by a good friend of the broadcast, Thierry Maison, the president of the Voltaire Network, uh, currently in Damascus, sometime advisor to the Syrian government. So we want to welcome Thierry and start off by asking for his comments on this military situation vis-a-vis -vis Turkey and Syria. We've just given a sketch of the Patriot missile batteries that have been pulled out, the six MiG-31s that have been sent to Damascus. But let's get uh, the full report from the ground, from the scene, and uh, give the microphone over to Thierry Maison. Welcome. Hello, Mr. Yes, the... The situation is that uh, uh, you remember that uh, um, Russia tried to negotiate a coalition between Syria, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia against Daesh, against the Islamic Emirates. Uh, but uh, this negotiation failed because uh, suddenly Turkey changed its mind. Turkey um, cancelled the contract for gas with, uh, with Russia, the, the Turkish stream. Right. Uh, Turkey also uh, decided to create a buffer zone in the north of, uh, of Syria, and they create uh, uh, an Islamic uh, uh, international brigade against uh, uh, Russia, and they sent some people from Daesh in Ukraine in front of the Crimea. And uh, they, they began a, a big uh, civil war against uh, the Kurds, not only in Turkey, but also in Iraq and in Syria. So uh, President Obama was obviously furious against this thing, 
Alt uh, was uh, President Putin, and they make uh, small agreements between them. So the the, the NATO decides to withdraw the Patriot missiles from Turkey. You you remember that uh, uh, at the beginning of 2013, um, NATO put some uh, Patriot missiles in Turkey to be sure that uh, the, the Syrian army uh, will not be able to bomb the jihadists in the north of the country. Because, uh, as you know, the, when you, you use the uh, military flight, you, you don't know exactly uh, where you are going, and you, you can enter in, uh, in Turkey um, when you try to bomb the north of Syria. Right. So, uh, so during uh, uh, two years, it was impossible for, for Syria to attack, to, to bomb the, the jihadists in the north of the country. Um, so the, the NATO decided to withdraw these things. So it means that NATO authorized uh, Syria now to bomb the jihadists. And at the same time, um, uh, Russia decided to enter inside Syria. You have to remember that since the beginning of the war in 2011, never, never the Russian army uh, was inside Syria. They sent some weapons, yes, but uh, never they sent uh, military advisor or things like that. So right now they create a military commission between uh, Syria and Russia. Then they sent uh, a six uh, MiG-31. Uh, in fact, uh, these uh, planes were built by uh, Syria in 2007, but it was not possible to to uh, deliver them uh, because of the embargo. But right now, they think there is no problem with such embargo because the embargo is, in fact, uh, only with weapons uh, they can use uh, against their own people. Uh, and, of course, uh, MiG-31 is an interceptor. That's not uh, a bombing, that's an interceptor. So you can use this, uh, uh, these planes only against other planes or against drones uh, from uh, other countries, of course, you have to think to Israel and to Turkey, because since the beginning of the war, uh, the jihadists don't have um, air force, but they use the Israeli and the Turkish air force uh, to support them when uh, they are in, uh, in danger. So uh, the, the, the Russian also, they sent they give for the first time uh, photos from satellites. This is very new, and this will change a lot of things. Because since the beginning of the war, um, the, the Syrian army don't have any photo from satellites. They don't know where are the jihadists. But the jihadists themselves, they have uh, satellite photo from NATO. And this is like that since the very beginning of the war in 2011. But since uh, six months, it seems, I'm not sure, it seems that now uh, NATO uh, don't give more uh, satellite photos to Daesh, to uh, the Islamic Emirates. But they continue to give this photo to Al-Qaeda, the uh, Al Nusra Front, we, we say here in Syria. Right. So this will change totally uh, the way to do the war here in Syria to have this uh, this kind of intelligence from uh, from satellite. Um, also, the the this military commission is. Uh, uh, trying to collect a lot of information about what is happening in different parts of Syria. Because Russia is now thinking to deploy uh, some troops inside Syria 
as peace force under the um, uh, uh, under the umbrella of uh, un uh, United Nations. You have to remember that uh, at the beginning of 2012, at the time of the first Geneva Conference, that time Russia and uh, the United States were partners. Now they are enemies, but uh, they were partners at that time. And uh, um, Russia was thinking to deploy um, troops from the organization of the Treaty of Collective Security. This is a, um, a kind of organization uh, uh, like the Varsovie Pact, but uh, now there is only six different countries in this, uh, in this pact, including uh, three countries with uh, a Muslim population, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. So it's easy for them to send troops from, from those uh, countries to fight against the Jihadists. But of course, they are only studying now this option. Uh, they will have a meeting of this organization uh, the 15th September in Tajikistan, in Dushanbe, and they will decide only at that time. So all these things uh, show us that uh, uh, the, uh, the military situation is totally changing now, and probably the jihadists um, will be ousted from a, a great part of the country. Hang on, Thierry. We'll be right back. We have that hard break coming up now with the music. We'll be right back with Thierry Maison from Damascus, Syria. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C., 21st of August, 2015. Uh, we're on the line with Thierry Maison. Honored to have him with us from, from Damascus. Thierry, um, I think this week we had President Putin of Russia making a trip to the Crimea, where he talked about foreign powers attempting to foment disturbances and causing um, sedition and so forth in Crimea. And I guess that's yes. that's targeting Erdogan of Turkey in particular. Yes, yes. Uh, of course, the Russians, they know perfectly that uh, right now some people from Daesh arrived in Kherson. This is a town uh, near Odessa in front of Crimea in, in Ukraine, and uh, they, they began to create this uh, Islamic brigade against Russia. And in the same town, you have now uh, also created by the CIA um, a kind of uh, uh, government in exile for Crimea. Hmm. All right, um, now, we were, just, we were just reviewing the situation here in Washington. Uh, we have two or three summer weekends left with Obama out of town, right? Obama in Martha's Vineyard on vacation. We know that the method used by General Allen, Allen the ISIS czar, is to try to do these um, intrigues, right? End runs, as they're called here, to try to create uh, – situations on the ground when the president is out of town, right? He's done this twice that we know of. And uh, we also see that Erdogan is starting an election campaign from a position of weakness, according to the polls, right? Erdogan does not look like a winner. It looks like the Kurdish party might even gain. So um, I guess we're, we're looking at a possibility of false flag operations if it comes to this. Yes, yes. Uh, already, uh, General John Allen tried to um, push the, the, the Turkish government to create this buffer zone in the north of Syria. Of course, this is totally illegal in uh, international rights because uh, they don't have mandates from the United Nations for that. And uh, so President Obama reacted uh, with drawing the, the the Patriot inside, so this will never happen. So now the problem for Erdogan um, is to uh, create a, 
a kind of uh, unity of a big majority for him in uh, in his country and to win the elections. So that's why probably he decided to attack the Kurds because really I don't understand other reason for such attack. You know, everybody was peaceful and suddenly uh, President Erdogan uh, alone decide to 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 block the the, the cease of fire between the uh, Turkish government and the PKK. The, P- the PKK, that's a, uh, a political party, which is a Marxist-Leninist one, and uh, which is very powerful in the Kurdish minority in uh, in Turkey in Syria, but not at all in Iraq. In Iraq, that's another uh, party which is important, uh, that's the party of the Barzani family. And uh, uh, in Iraq, the the Kurdish leaders are linked to Israel, and especially President Barzani himself is a member of the Mossad. So in, uh, um, in Turkey, uh, they began to bomb the, the Kurdish people without reason at all, huh? but they began to bomb them. At the beginning of the civil war, already inside Turkey, they killed in, in uh, uh, two weeks about uh, 300 uh, Kurdish people, and they killed 500 more, both in uh, Syria and in, uh, in Iraq. Uh, the, the President uh, Erdogan uh, also, um, uh, also he, he, he was hoping that uh, uh, such confrontation will uh, um, push uh, the people in his country to, to support him because they will be afraid by the, the idea of a civil war. Right now it is beginning, in fact, because... Uh, the, the Kurdish people try to organize themselves to protect themselves. Uh, two days ago, they decide to uh, um, uh, to, to declare that uh, the Dersim uh, district will be um, not not independent but uh, uh, autonomous, and uh, um, they began to attack um, police and. Uh, uh, militaries inside Turkey. So that, that's really the beginning of a uh, of civil war. So um, it, it seems that inside Turkey, nobody wants to, to support uh, uh, Erdogan in this civil war. And the last poll uh, shows that uh, um, the, the CHP, which is the the official party for the PKK, for the Kurds, but the CHP is also a party from all the left with uh, ecologists, with uh, uh, socialists, with different people inside. So this party uh, is now growing, and they could add 70% of the votes in the next election, the 1st November. Uh, At the same time, in the, in the uh, uh, Iraqi part of the Kurdistan, in, uh, in Iraq, you know, you have this uh, regional power of Kurdistan, was created by the uh, United States uh, with uh, Mossad, the, the Badani family at the head. And uh, according to the constitution of Iraq, uh, that uh, the United States uh, wrote in 2005, According to this constitution, it's not possible for the president of Kurdistan to bring a second mandate. But in fact, um, Mr. Barzani, Masoud Barzani, is president of uh, uh, Kurdistan since 2003. Uh, he was not elected. At, <laughs> yes, that's incredible. He was not elected at that time. He was elected in 2005, just before the new constitution. So the, uh, the, um, the constitution don't apply to the first mandate. He, he was re- re-elected in 2009. And in 
2013, of course, it was not possible to be elected, so he asked to his parliament to extend his mandate for two years. This uh, was ended the 19th August, and uh, uh, the U.S. ambassador, the U.K. ambassador, and the special representative for United Nations came to Erbil and asked to the 16 um, political parties of the Iraqi Kurds to extend again the mandate of Masoud Barzani. So you have to understand that for the United States, the democracy is only a word and uh, never a So it's, it's very uh, flexible. Sorry? It's very flexible. Yes, <laughs> it can be whatever they very want. Flexible, yes. Yes, very but Jerry, flexible. one other question now. We've talked yes. about the PKK. We've talked yes. about Barzani, but now there's this other group. Uh, the YPG is the military force of a political yes. party. Maybe a word or two about them. Yes, you know, in fact, uh, uh, everybody here is talking about the PKK. This is the, the normal way to to talk for this uh, party. Uh, during the Cold War, the uh, head of this party, uh, Mr. Ochalan, who was uh, living inside Damascus. He was protected by the Syrian state. Gary, I'm because, sorry we've, yes. we've got that hard break coming. We'll, we'll cover the YPG and uh, related topics hopefully okay. next week if we can get you back. Thank you so much. Okay. See Goodbye. you next week. A tout à l'heure. And we'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to the second hour of World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley speaking from Washington, D.C. Now, the last question I was trying to ask Thierry Maison was about the Democratic Union Party among the Kurds, the PYD, and their military arm, the YPG. And the YPG are the ones that had been seen, for example, last summer in action <clears throat> driving ISIS out of Kobane, despite the fact that the Turkish military was taking pot shots at the Kurds from across the border and allowing ISIS to cross Turkish territory all they wanted to uh, carry out terrorist activities, try to take the Kurds uh, in the rear. But the Kurds nevertheless fought through and have dominated most of that border now, except for that 68 or 70 mile stretch, which uh, may be shrinking, who knows, but uh, in the future, I think it will. And that's that's the situation we're left with. Now, we got to change gears and take a look at Greece because we want to try to get a report from Athens uh, this afternoon. Right? As people have seen, the Greek prime minister, Alexis Tsipras, has resigned. And um, it looks like a new election could well be held in about one month's time, say around the 20th or so of September. We'll get the details on that. Uh, this comes after the passing of the austerity program dictated by the European uh, Union. Now, in some ways, this is a failure of uh, statecraft. When, when you think of somebody like Abraham Lincoln, you can see somebody who had an exquisite sense of timing. The Emancipation Proclamation, if it had been delivered a year earlier, would have been widely rejected, would have been a political disaster. And if it had come a year later, it might well have um, been too late to help the Union win the war with the 200,000 black troops who proudly took their place in the Union Army, although there were problems. But this was the big the big turning point, right? It became a revolutionary war at that point. Now, in the case of Greece, uh, we followed all of this step by step. It would have been necessary, first of all, to assemble an international coalition, Greece alone, against the 29 countries of the European Union is not viable. And Greece even alone against the 18 countries of the Euro bloc not viable. You needed a Syriza International of political parties. You needed, uh, if possible, a Mediterranean or poor man's pact, a, an anti-debt pact, an anti-derivatives bloc. Uh, in other words, a group of countries that could have formed a, a coalition inside 
the European Union if you were going to stay there and fight to take control of the European Central Bank, fight to block Schäuble, fight to influence Draghi or get rid of Draghi or whatever, whatever it would have been. So the international dimension, uh, I would say this, this entire battle, when you look back at it, um, the, the hope must have been that as you came out with these positions, uh, as Tsipras did, that you would get other countries joining in. But unfortunately, the degradation of the Eurogark, Eurocrat class is that uh, they, they're they not going to do that. The other side of it is to be ready technically. In other words, statesmanship, statecraft means that when the decisive moment comes, right, you know, that Friedrich von Schiller called it the punctum saliens. The punctum saliens is the decisive point where you've got to be ready. And the the point would have been on the Sunday of the referendum, that fateful Sunday, when it was clear that the um, Greek people did not want austerity, they voted against austerity, it would have been necessary to go into action with a program of uh, seizing control of the central bank. Right? We know the story about the 20 euro notes that we've talked about. You could have started printing, printing liquidity in the form of 20 euro notes and then take that into the legal system of the European Union, fight there, and as you were doing that, convince the Greek population that uh, if Schäuble were not to relent, you'd then have to face life as the drachma, but tell how to do it. And unfortunately, Varoufakis, although he seems to have had good intentions. Varoufakis was not able, as he himself says, to make the transition from having five officials ready to implement this program, and one of them, uh, the American economist Galbraith, for whatever that's worth. Uh, the five officials then had to turn into a thousand trained, prepared, and determined officials. Varoufakis never made that transition. And then, of course, you had to have uh, your um, payment system ready to go. He had made significant progress in that regard. But um, there are other things. And, and I, I say this from the point of view of the fact I am the author of the only plan B that I'm aware of that was ever presented. And this was some weeks before the decisive Sunday. I put out a plan B. You can see it at uh, Tarpley. Dot net, and it talks about things like barter deals, building up stocks, international accords. And again, it always gets back to this international dimension. Where's your international dimension? So uh, the point with the Syriza experience is to study it and to learn the lessons of it, things that you should imitate, and there are quite a few, to be sure, but things that you must not imitate. And what you must not imitate is the one country at a time, go it alone, lone wolf, or perhaps even chauvinist policy. Uh, again, when you're dealing with an international, supranational authority, you've got to constitute a block. And that means uh, you've got to look at politics in a way which is different from what we've seen on the part of the, uh, of the Syriza uh, leaders. And then again, the timing is everything. It's got to be at the precise time. The punctum saliens, once it passes, it's gone, and it will not return, at least not in the same form. Now, it's not the end of the world for Greece. Uh, it simply means that you've got to think about this in a totally different way. Aren't there other countries with whom you could make alliances, be it at the level of parties through a Syriza International or at the level of governments? Now, Syriza has split. Uh, over the uh, third bailout, right, and these odious austerity measures. 25 parliamentarians of Syriza out of about, what, 140 have, have uh, left the party. They split, and that, therefore they call themselves popular unity, unity because they split. Um, I guess that's, that's political license. I, I won't begrudge them that. However, we've we got to get some statements from this guy, Lafazanis, who is the head of it, right? He's a veteran leftist, I guess he's a former communist. The, the problem that I have with him is from what I've heard of his initial speech, he says he wants to sweep away the memorandum, 
But the question is, that has just been tried, and that didn't work out too well. So what is your new thing? What is new? Where's the beef? Uh, how do you propose to do this? What have you learned? Right? I, I, hope, I hope that La Fazanis will come forward with these things, because we would be very anxious to hear them. And again, in the meantime, I, Tarpley, am the only author of a Plan B that was uh, submitted to the court of world public opinion. Now, the new democracy, right, the Samaras party, now under the leadership of Maimarakis. So Maimarakis says, hey, we don't need to have an election. We need to put us into power. We'll take over the government. This was the IMF formula for, uh, what, 2011, I guess it was, when they put in that that um, Wall Street uh, official as the as the prime minister. So if you want to talk tough, you better be ready, because when you're dealing with a thug like Schäuble, he's going to put you to the test. So uh, we wish everybody well. We wish Tsipras well, and we wish Lafazanis well. I would hope that if there is an election, the total number of deputies between the two will be greater than 140 that Syriza started with. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Topsy here in Washington, D.C. Now, we want to get the view of these uh, Greek events, of course, from Michael Chiotinis in Athens. So we want to welcome Michael. And the great curiosity, Michael, that we have here is Lafazanis and the Popular Unity Group, and we are interested in knowing if uh, if we can choose between Cyprus, if the Greek voter can choose between Cyprus and Lafazanis, is there a chance maybe that they'll get more votes if there's an election? And of course, we've heard this brief statement from Lafazanis, where he says he wants to sweep away the memorandum. We're wondering if he said anything more than that. In other words, if he said anything new or something that would show that he's realized. Uh, the lessons of, of what has happened. And uh, naturally, we're in a goodwill dialogue with, uh, with Tsipras on the one hand and with Lafazanis on the other, as much as we can. So what does it look like? Yes, exactly. These are two very different approaches, and we have to wait and see how this plays out. Um, Lafazanis is quite clear, I think, I think the main thing is that he runs, he will run on the program, on Syriza's program, previous program, um, but without the restrictions of, uh, you know, staying in the euro or something like that. So I would, uh, I would uh, expect something like that, but we will see and we should study this. Now, Tsipras have, has resigned and his government have resigned. Um, addressing the Greek people, Tsipras blamed um, MPs from inside his party for the fact that there is practically no majority in parliament anymore. So this is the main thing of the election. That's why elections are held. Now, the procedure now uh, is as follows. The president of the republic gives three mandates to explore the possibility of forming a government. Again, they are called exploratory mandates. Right. One mandate to each of the leaders of the three largest parliamentary groups. Now, as they stand today, theoretically, the first mandate will go to Tsipras again, the second to the Conservatives, and the third to Golden Dawn, the Nazis. But Syriza's left platform, uh, led by Lafazanis, as you said, has just formed this new parliamentary group, this is a parliamentary group. This is not yet a party. It's a parliamentary group. Obviously, there's going to be a party, but right now it's a parliamentary group, consisted of Syriza MPs who voted no to the new bailout. And these people are at least 25. And Golden Dawn only has 17 MPs. So this new parliamentary group, which has been called um, Popular Unity, will soon be officially the third largest parliamentary group, which means that it will get the third exploratory mandate to form a government. This is probably of no significance, but we have to report this. You never know what could happen. Uh, when, when the three attempts, when these three attempts fail, there's going to be an attempt for a national unity government or, or something like that. But since Tsipras doesn't want this, it, it can happen, realistically. 
practically we're going to have elections probably September 20th or so. Mm -hmm. It'll be an attempt by Tsipras to gain a healthy majority again. This is, I think this is his project. He, he, of course, of course, people who voted no will, will not be on the ballot. So they will go to somewhere else. And very interestingly, in the, in at least 16 major electoral regions of the country out of around 30, uh, so around half of the major, of the electoral regions of the country, um, these people who voted no and are going to go, are going to going to, are going to um, go to elections with La Fazanis, were first at the vote count at each region. The most important example is, of course, Varoufakis himself, Yanis Varoufakis, who was, as an individual candidate, by far the first in, in the single most populated electoral region, the second electoral region of Athens. Uh, but still, I think Tsipras will almost certainly be the winner again of the election. But what, but we should wait and see how this plays out again. So, Michael, uh, just to get yes. it straight now, Varoufakis is one of the 25 who has gone with Lafazanis into the no. new popular unity. Not yet. Not yet. Not all yet. the others, okay. all the other 16, 16 candidates, top candidates have gone with uh, Lafazanis. But Varoufakis is, um, has st stated that he is not going to be a candidate for Syriza. No way. But he, he hasn't cleared his intentions on uh, whether he will be a candidate with Lafazanis or not. He may, he may uh, stop uh, the, uh, politics, you know, uh, leave politics. Maybe he's not. He 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 can't be um, anywhere. He can't be. Um, no no party represents his views because, of course, Varoufakis' view was you should try something of a euro liquidity of the IOUs and something like that. This approach is never going to come realistically again to the to, to a new government. Michael, in in politics, we've learned never to say never. Uh, especially in a situation where the uh, you know the world financial system is crashing, uh, <laughs> even I this afternoon, right. right? The Dow is down 531 points after going yeah. down to about 400 yesterday. So we don't know. How about yes. of the 25 others in uh, in in the new uh, popular unity with Lafazanis? Any other people we might recognize? Of course, uh, Lapavitas. We right, uh, the professor. The professor. Yeah. Yes, he, he's he's one of the, the very important people. I think his approach is is a political approach, and it's very it's respectable. And I think Tsipras' approach is also respectable. Tsipras, I think, is trying is trying to um, show that he's being um, coerced to um, up, to do um, to follow a po policies that he doesn't agree with. And he's trying to show maybe that these policies don't work. But the difference um, with, the, with the previous governments is that he says, I disagree, you know, openly. He openly disagrees with the policy that he implements. And that's, I think that's a change. But both approaches, both the Euro exit approach and Cyprus approach, have merits. That's what we should um, realize here. Exactly. Certainly. Yes. One is one is the Grexit, and the other one is uh, under duress. I'm doing this, but I'm doing it under duress, and I reserve the right to appeal it once again. Um, yes. Now, naturally, Michael, a lot of your fans over here would love to see you as a candidate, uh, say, for the popular unity or whatever wherever your political home might be uh we'll that. talk about that in the future um i guess that's the end of our time uh i see my maracas wants to have a new democracy government and no election at all right it's always the same story with them yes yes we'll okay. see about that we'll see you next week thank you very much thank Michael you very much Giotinas in athens Let's remind everybody about Reverend Edward Pinckney, the most distinguished political prisoner here in the United States. He can't be with us this afternoon because he's got uh, visits uh, taking place. So these somehow rule out being able to call out. 
under the Rick Snyder uh, system. But let's call everybody's attention to the fact that on Wednesday, August 26th at 12 noon, there will be a free Pinckney demonstration in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, at the state appellate court, right, the Court of Appeals in Grand Rapids of the state of Michigan. And this is the Michigan Hall of Justice, Michigan Hall of Justice, located at 925 West Ottawa Street uh, in, uh, I'm sorry, this is going to be Lansing, Michigan, 48915. So the Michigan Hall of Justice. So uh, check the uh, check the details on that. But Wednesday, August twenty sixth, we will correct that if necessary in the next uh, segment. So uh, the world financial situation. Now we're just uh, taking a look. It's a Friday in uh, August. The Dow is down five hundred and thirty one points. That's approximately. 3.12 percent, Nasdaq down 3.5 percent, S and P down 3.19 uh, percent. Now the question here is the contraction, a violent contraction of production and employment and exports taking place in China. Now last week we explored the political side of this, right? The Chinese Communist Party is simply not legitimate. They're not elected. They're they're just uh, appointed, co-opted, whatever it is, and uh, the public be damned. So they go through with that. It's not legitimate. But the legitimation that they'd gotten uh, has been through, as we always call it, eudaimonic legitimation. In other words, if you deliver the goods, a rising standard of living, full employment, or at least improving employment, and other practical improvements, that can serve quite well as a legitimation. However, once, if you have a a government which is intrinsically illegitimate, and then you don't have the improving standard of living, then you're in big trouble. And it looks like the Xi group, the Xi leadership of China, has got two problems. One is a practical problem, that they've lost control of the stock markets. In other words, whatever their dirigistic tools are, they have diminished them, right? They have uh, scaled them back. And now that they need them, they don't seem to work. So there is a problem there. We can't rule out, of course, international Anglo-American hanky-panky in this stuff. But the practical problem is you got to be able to control the stock market uh, if you're going to have an economy like this. And the second side of it is what we just said. The principal question, uh, the ideological question is if, you're, if your legitimacy is a rising standard of living and that begins to, uh, to depart from the scene, then you have trouble. So the, the statistic this morning that has caused a lot of problems, factory output in China is now at a six and one half year low. Um, now, a lot of things are happening around this. Um, the, um, the question is uh, whether uh, China can uh, somehow uh, stabilize this stuff. The, the fact that the Chinese economy is contracting has had a tremendous impact on all kinds of raw material prices. Since they are the healthiest industrial economy, they consume the most. Oil is now $40 or less. The other side of it is the competitive devaluations, right? Whatever Pepe Escobar and other superficial observers might think about this, once you start with these competitive devaluations, it leads to chaos, right? We can say maybe that Abe of Japan and Abenomics were the first ones to go for this, but we've had a uh, significant uh, competitive devaluation in China. Beggar my neighbor is the key word here. Uh, Vietnam has now devalued its currency by 1%, and they've also uh, expended the band, the fluctuation band uh, on their peg has been expanded by 3%. So this might be as much as a 4% uh, devaluation. Kazakhstan, caught between Russia, where the ruble is at a six-month low, 
And China, where the renminbi, the yuan, is being uh, devalued, the Kazakhstan tenga has been cut in value by 29%, almost one third. So, so far, Japan let it off. China last week, Kazakhstan, Vietnam. Let's go through some others. Georgia, uh, Tiflis has recently devalued. Uh, Azerbaijan had devalued already in March. Uh, Kazakhstan, remember, is trying to compensate for the low ruble and the low renminbi. Let's look at some others. Um, possible candidates for devaluation, somehow in the Central Asian realm, the stands, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzia, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Azerbaijan, quite possibly for the second time. Azerbaijan once in March, now possibly for the second time. Another currency that's under tremendous pressure is the Nigerian Naira. And uh, I guess that more or less rounds it up. But you can see this is now a chaos of competitive devaluations. This is highly detrimental to economic activities. It increases currency risk all over the world. There's also the problem now of the Fed minutes. Will the Federal Reserve raise interest rates in the way that all the rentiers have been demanding? Everybody who's rich and has masses of money wants to get more interest on it. The rest of us who have credit card debt well, we're not so interested in that, are we? This doesn't look like such an attractive uh, proposition. So one of the things that set off the big uh, kerfuffle yesterday was the Fed uh, minutes. Uh, I would urge people, if you're going to look at charts, right, sometimes you can look at charts. You might find head and shoulders and things like this. right? I don't mean dandruff. I mean a pattern on the chart. Uh, remember, Instantaneous charts, one-day charts are useless. They are useless. All, they, all you can do with a one-day chart is to say, oh, it's actually political economy, and a political event will always impact the, the stock market if it's big enough and important enough. Get yourself some longer-term charts. Get a five-year, a 10-year, a 15-year, and then you begin to see some historical patterns. In other words, this civilization is radically anti-historical, and that's bad news. Uh, Oil continuing to go down. The other thing is a lot of derivatives have been nailed into place, making assumptions that are not reflected in this panorama of chaos that I've just given you. And I, I actually I forgot to mention the Mongolian Tugrik, the Mongolian currency under pressure. And earlier in the program, we pointed out that the Turkish pound is at three to a dollar. That's an all time low for the Turkish uh, pound, right? The Turkish lira, as it's sometimes called. Uh, so that is quite a mess. Uh, probably the Fed will have something to say about this from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, in uh, in a couple of uh, days, maybe next week. So we'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Concerning this free Pinkney demonstration. Um, it's, it's going to be Wednesday the 26th at noon in Grand Rapids at the appellate court. Um, but just to double check that, take a look at Free Pinckney and uh, we'll, have, we'll put up an explanatory note uh, providing all of the, uh, the relevant uh, details. Okay, or, or take a look at my Twitter, uh, Webster G. Tarpley on Twitter. All right, so uh, that's the world economic uh, crisis, and naturally, uh, a bubble has occurred under the conditions of quantitative easing one, two, and three. Uh, that's a bubble. Uh, there's an asset bubble. The uh, real estate situation here in uh, Washington, D.C. is extremely tight, tight as a drum, one might say. Um, so there's a lot of speculative hot air. And what the Chinese leadership has done, very foolishly, is once you once the bubble starts, people get caught up in the enthusiasm. It's like the punch bowl. And if you try to take the punch bowl away, they're going to come after you and people are going to protest bitterly. As I, I think I told you in Taiwan uh, a couple of decades ago, 
The people were demonstrating, saying, how dare you allow these stocks to go down? Stocks are supposed to go up. Well, that's not the speculative uh, game, is it? They're always going to fluctuate. Now, we want to say a few words about uh, domestic politics, and this mainly comes down to Trump. Uh, Trump is a fascist, and this is becoming increasingly clear. As a matter of fact, the fascist Trump, you're going to see all of the scoundrels in this society orient like iron filings to a magnet around Trump. His message, xenophobia, racism, and the cynical, nihilistic brutality of a finance oligarch and silver spoon kid, right? Because this is not somebody who, this is not a Horatio Alger story, right? This is not the bootstraps that pulled him up, nothing of the kind. And I was appalled by Trump's uh, plan, right? That he wants to confiscate the earnings of people in this country because of this technicality, quite simply, right? Oh, it's illegal. Well, Lots of things are illegal, right? The whole political system here is based on terrorism and assassinations. Why don't you start with that rather than trying to beat up on uh, relatively helpless uh, Im immigrants, right? Coming here to work <laughs> and they pay taxes. They sure do pay taxes because they get their money is withheld just like anybody else's. Uh, and if they don't file a return, that's the end of it. And they don't get the benefit on Social Security. So um, we uh, repudiate. Uh, Trump, he's a know-nothing. He's a neo-Confederate. This is the dark side of U.S. politics. And I've tried to explain again and again, and I've now uh, put it in writing, maybe uh, for the first time in a while anyway, that uh, the United States has one critical strategic advantage. The critical strategic advantage of the United States is the propensity, the willingness of people from Latin America to come here and work initially at rather low wages, but make their homes here and transfer their loyalty to the United States. That takes a while, especially with a labor market this awful. Uh, it doesn't go as fast as it once did. It could go quite fast once again if you fix the uh, labor market. So uh, the country is built on immigration. And Legal, illegal for quite a long time. That that was simply a uh, uh, a moot point, and right? it was simply a, an abstraction that didn't didn't really mean anything. So, uh, if you're native-born worker, you have a right to be protected. Absolutely, you deserve a fifteen-dollar minimum wage, so that some desperate immigrant cannot undercut you unfairly competing. You deserve a protective tariff of 15 percent so that more and more factories will have to be built here in the United States. Uh, and you deserve a union movement. In other words, roll back the infamous Taft-Hartley law, slave labor law, and uh, get something uh, more like the Wagner Act, which gives everybody the guaranteed federal right to organize for collective bargaining. That was the Wagner Act under the New Deal. Uh, in a larger sense, of course, the situation of the labor market will require the 30 million new productive jobs, which we propose to create, paid for, financed with 0% financing over decades, up to a century, century loan, if necessary, uh, all of that uh, financed through the nationalized Federal Reserve, right? The National Bank of the United States. And quite specifically, the Marshall Plan for the cities and for rural America, for black unemployed in the inner cities and for Appalachian uh, unemployed in similar areas, you've got to have the Wall Street sales tax and use that money to create 10 million introductory jobs, right? Entry-level jobs for people who have not been in the workforce and who need to be trained or otherwise acclimated, oriented to the world of productive and gainful employment. So uh, this is uh, some of the stuff that I put out this week. It's a, uh, a statement uh, in uh, the briefing for the 19th, I think. Let me just check. 
sorry, it's the 20th, and it's, uh, it's all about the war on immigration mandated by the fascist Trump spells U.S. national suicide while guaranteeing Chinese world domination. Mass deportations would establish a fascist police state and squander the greatest American advantage as against competitors. Trump also reflects abominable pessimism, historical pessimism, cultural pessimism. This reflects a tremendous crisis of U.S. culture and ideology. And when it comes to the 14th Amendment and the anchor babies, you go to that national cemetery in Gettysburg that Lincoln dedicated and stand face to face with the Union dead. They fought for the 14th Amendment, 13th, 14th, and 15th, right? No more slavery. Everybody born here is a citizen, and everybody gets a right to vote. That's the union cause. That's the, uh, those are the institutional changes that came out of that Revolutionary War. Now, along comes the loudmouth bully, the megalomaniac hotelier Trump, and now, again, his brigade of uh, dubious characters, uh, and they want to ram this through. I also have to appeal to elementary class consciousness. How in the world can you be so stupid as to think that a multi-billionaire could care anything about you or your family or your fate uh, and someone this crude, right, this um, – barbaric, I guess we'd have to say, ignorant, profoundly ignorant, but repeating the cynical table conversation of Mexican oligarchs and other oligarchs with whom he hobnobs preferentially. How do you think he could care one whit about any American working family? The idea is such, it implies such gullibility P.T. Barnum is laughing. There's a sucker born more than every minute. It's getting to be several times a minute, P.T. Barnum would have to say. Um, Hello, sucker would probably be a good uh, campaign slogan for Donald Trump. So um, the Tax Wall Street Party supports uh, orderly immigration, certainly, but got to remember – Everybody else in the world has a severe demographic crisis. China, with their crackpot one-child-per-family policy, you could see it coming. It was all predicted. They were told. They did it anyway. Now they're wallowing in a tremendous problem. Japan, probably the oldest population in the world, but the European Union, Germany, Italy even, uh, breathing down their necks, coming up fast in terms of the age of the population. Russia had been strongly collapsing now i hope stabilized to get the idea the greatest strategic advantage of the united states is that people are willing to come here don't throw that away we'll be back next week on world crisis radio